Tailgating before a Minnesota Viking football game is enjoyable when you include refreshing Ham's beer. The beer that helped to make the land of sky blue waters famous for more than 106 years. Gary Quazzo, the cool strategist, stepped in at quarterback in 1970 and quickly filled Joe Cap's shoes. He moved up a rung on the quarterback's success ladder with every game. There were times when he might have looked like Cap, but he was his own man, and he won. Bob Lee, virtually a rookie, filled in for the injured Quazzo during the titled stretch and led his team like a veteran. A major part of the quarterback's success belongs to the offensive line. Number 53, center Mick Tinglehoff. Number 63, Jim Vallone. Right guard Milt Sunday, number 64. Captain Grady Alderman, number 67. And number 73, budding superstar Ron Yeary. With Ed White and Doug Davis filling in, the line threw up a wall around the quarterback. While Quazzo and his line gave direction to the offense, the receivers threw in the spice. Number 27, Bob Grimm, stopped at nothing to make a catch. He split time with John Henderson, number 80, who ended up the team's second leading pass receiver. The Vikings tight end is number 87, John Beasley. But the Vikings premier receiver is Gene Washington, number 84. The Viking receivers added the spice, and the Viking runners added the character. Hard, driving, not pretty, but effective. Number 41, Dave Osborne, sometimes cradles the ball like a boy with a new puppy. But he has the savvy of a pool hustler. Don't let him fool you. He's not the fanciest, and not the fastest. All he'll do is beat you. Dave Osborne doesn't like to be stopped. Number 26, Clint Jones spun and slashed his way to his best year as a pro. Fullback Bill Brown, number 30, plays the game the same way every year, with all-out effort. Not pretty, but effective. Number 32, Oscar Reed, is a young runner with a bright future. But he was slowed by injuries in 1970. Led by Captain Jim Lindsay, the Vikings specialty teams played with their usual abandon. Clint Jones returned kickoffs. So did Charlie West, number 40.
Fred Cox was cut by the Vikings in 1962. It's a good thing he came back for another try. He was the Vikings' most valuable player in 1970, setting records almost every time he kicked. But it is defense that has made the Vikings what they are. Theirs allowed fewer points than any other in football in 1970, and that is what the people came to cheer for. They cheered for the best front four in the league. Number 70 is Captain Jim Marshall. Number 88, Alan Page was voted the top defensive player in the NFC in 1970. Page is not on his way to greatness. He is already there. His backup, Paul Dixon, may be the finest fifth man in the game. Number 77 is pro bowler Gary Larson, the strong man. All pro Carl Eller, number 81, is one of the best defensive ends in football. The people also came to cheer a marauding core of linebackers. Roy Winston, number 60 at 30, is the old man of the group. And middleman Lonnie Warwick, number 59, makes old men out of young runners, fast. So does number 58, Wally Hilgenberg. Number 49 is Dale Hackbart. The fans cheered a pass defense that made 28 interceptions and allowed just six touchdowns, by far the best in the NFL. Number 45 is Ed Shirockman. He led the team with seven interceptions. He was aided by Carl Kosulke, number 29 and by Bobby Bryant, number 20, and by Charlie West, number 40. Paul Krause, number 22, rounded out the backfield with six interceptions. This defense did two things better than anyone else, win and hit. <laughs> Quarterback Gary Quazzo had been at the Super Bowl, and he remembered. His entire team remembered. Thus, for Minnesota, 1970's first game was really 69's last, a chance to put a bitter memory to rest. The memory died quickly. It fell under a relentless assault on the past. When it was over, Minnesota had dominated every facet of the game and the Kansas City Chiefs were crushed 27 to 10. The Vikings had gained their revenge and now they were ready for the last of their first 10 years. And in Minnesota, there was no question about the pure toughness of the Vikings opposition. The only question was, could a young dentist from downtown Minneapolis find happiness in trying to avenge last season's Super Bowl loss to the world champion Kansas City Chiefs? Only Gary Quazzo, number 15, who is both a practicing dentist and a practicing quarterback, knew the answer as he stepped in to fill the cavity left by Joe Capp's departure. As it turned out, Quazzo filled the cavity with 24 karat gold. His first test came when the Kansas City punt left him stranded on his own three. Displaying the expertise of a trained technician, Quazzo began drilling into the chief's secondary.
And when the Viking quarterback had taken his team the length of the field, not even the Chiefs' massive defense could stop number 41, Dave Osborne, from putting the finishing touches on what for the Chiefs was a painful operation. But painful wasn't the half of it when the vaunted Viking defense started yanking teeth. Number 88, Alan Page, led a charge that crumbled the Kansas City attack. And when Chief Quarterback Lenny Dawson did get off a pass, Paul Krauss, number 22, made him wish he hadn't because the interception led to a touchdown. The defense capped a day of vengeance when number 70, Jim Marshall, recovered a fumble and racing toward the end zone, lateral to number 60, Roy Winston. The Chiefs finally came out from under the anesthetic, but a 59-yard touchdown from Dawson to number 89, Otis Taylor, was small compensation when all it did was make the score nearly respectable at 27-10. Although he must have been laughing on the inside, Viking head coach Bud Grant wore the same look in victory as he had in defeat. It made one wonder if perhaps he needs some dental work to fix his smile. If so, there's a good quarterback in Minneapolis who should be able to take care of that. The defense set up win number two by blocking two New Orleans punts and holding the Saints ground game to a stingy 50 yards. Fred Cox kicked four field goals and number 55, Mike McGill's jog, with this futile punt attempt, gave the Vikings a 26-0 margin. Viking fans have become accustomed to defensive perfection, and last Sunday, the New Orleans Saints were quickly indoctrinated. Togetherness is the creed of the Purple Gang, and the front four crowded into the Saint backfield as a unit. The Saints' first half effort was worth a total of 11 yards. Togetherness also means demon dedication by the Viking special teams. Saint punter Julian Fagan found Carl Kosoki's chest where the ball should have been, and number 45 Ed Shirokman gathered in the touchdown. New Orleans refused to play dead, and number 17, Bill Kilmer, finally found sanctuary from the Viking rush. But even time could not buy success, as linebacker Lonnie Warwick, number 59, took his turn to wander through the befuddled Saints. The interception and a fumble recovery set up two Fred Cox field goals as the Minnesota defense and special teams accounted for the entire first half scoring output. In the third quarter, the Viking offense finally asserted itself on a Gary Quazzo strike to Clint Jones, who left Saints strewn all along his 72-yard track. Viking scoring responsibilities were returned to the offense as Quazzo sprinted out, up, and over from the three. But even this gesture was lacking as a violation nullified the touchdown. The Vikings had to find other ways to score, so they returned to their first half pattern. Consistent Fred Cox was ready again. Also remaining on alert were the special teams. 
This time, Fagan attempted a novel 10-step approach. The results were nearly identical, with number 55, Mike McGill, getting the touchdown. The Minnesota Vikings know what togetherness can mean. On this day, the offense had failed, but the team had found out that there are many ways to win. Game number three was against the Green Bay Packers. The Viking defense was again tough to crack, limiting Packer runners to 57 yards. Gene Washington made one of the season's super catches of this Quazo pass. But the shouting didn't last long because the Vikings lost. Dave Hampton took a fourth quarter kickoff one yard deep in his end zone and ran it back all the way, giving the Packers a 13-10 upset victory. In Milwaukee last week, the underdog Packers and the champion Vikings played a good old-fashioned Central Division type game. And that means a double dose of defense, as demonstrated by number 81 All-Pro Carl Eller. Eller and his fellow Minnesota Maulers gave Bart Starr another rough afternoon. Sometimes Starr found it advisable to share his burden. Several times Donnie Anderson was the unfortunate recipient. For the Packers, number 82, Lionel Aldridge, led a defensive charge which devastated the Vikings' good offensive line and crumpled quarterback Gary Coazzo six times. The game's only touchdown from scrimmage came in the final moments on a great effort by Viking receiver Gene Washington, number 84. The big play for the Packers also came in the fourth quarter as Dave Hampton, number 25, fielded a kickoff one yard deep in the end zone. Dave Hampton's run and two Packer field goals, top Gene Washington's catch and one Viking field goal, as Green Bay defeated arch rival Minnesota for the first time in five tries, 13 to 10. Before the Vikings left for Chicago, Coach Bud Grant said, we are now in a very challenging segment of our schedule. The challenge was met head on. Clint Jones gained some of the toughest yards in football against the fierce, free-swinging Bear defense. Ed Obradovich thought he had something going when he picked up this football, but the ball was correctly ruled dead, and a little holding from his friend saved the day for angry Ed. Alan Page picked up a mid-air fumble and went 65 yards with it.
The Purple Gang won 24-0. At Wrigley Field in Chicago, quarterback Jack Concannon, number 11, had grandiose plans for dealing with the Vikings. Unfortunately for the Bears, execution of these plays was another matter. Too often, Chicago faltered when their chance came. Too often, they dropped passes that had easy touchdown written all over them. Perhaps Chicago was too busy thinking about the Purple Punishers to concentrate on carrying out their game plan. Every time Jack Concannon would breathe a spark of life into them, the Bears would somehow manage to douse it themselves. Minnesota's Gary Larson, number 77, recovered this fumble. And from there, it was all Clint Jones, number 26. Even a bare avalanche could not stop the highballing Jones. And on this play, his great second effort was rewarded by seven points. Then it was back to the Lavender Hill mob, led by a master thief named Alan Page. Once he had the ball, he was off and running and not even Gail Sayers could catch him. While the Vikings had their Butch Cassidy in the person of Alan Page, the Bears had Ed Obradovich, number 87. He scooped up the ball and took off on a fairly decent impersonation of the Sundance Kid. But the play was ruled as an incompleted pass, and at least one referee was glad Obradovich wasn't wearing a tearaway jersey. Finally, it was number 15, Gary Quazzo to Gene Washington on a 49-yard streak. And the Vikings had a piece of first place in the NFC Central Division, as well as their second shutout of the year, 24 to nothing. The Dallas Cowboys were the Vikings' next foe, and another sellout crowd saw some polite football early. But the Vikings returned to form when number 45, Ed Shirokman, got hot and turned the game into a rout. When Shirokman finished stampeding the Cowboys, Minnesota sat on the top side of a record 54-13 score. The Dallas Cowboys, challengers for dominance in the NFC East, met the contending Vikings in Bloomington, Minnesota. And they quickly got a feeling for some of that Central Division local color, black and blue.
The bruising, aggressive, opportunistic Vikings special teams attack the Cowboys. Spiked this punt, and Ed Shirockman pressed the advantage for six points. Shirokman leading the marauding purple, cashed this interception for his second touchdown of the day. Number 70, Jim Marshall, redirected this pass, not originally intended for teammate Alan Page, and Page tanked down deep into Cowboy territory. For the Cowboys, it was just too much Ed Shirokman and too, too much of the mighty, tough, purple horde. The Viking defense was relentless, while the offense was consistent and effective. The Cowboys had their moments, but not many like this one late in the fourth period. For the most part, the high-stepping Calvin Hill was throttled. And the Dallas Doomsday defense was shredded as the Cowboys suffered their most embarrassing defeat on record. But for the Purple, possibly a crowning victory. The following week brought the Rams to town for a Monday night game, and in bad weather, the Rams came out hitting. But the Vikings hit harder. Bill Brown put Minnesota out front with this first quarter catch, and the defense won the game late in the half. The Rams took three cracks at the Viking goal line and got nowhere. After two shots, the defense wanted to go home, but the officials insisted the Rams have another try. They failed and Minnesota went on to win 13 to three. Second down and six from the 29, and Quazzo is back to throw. He swings it out to Osborne. Osborne, who is a very nifty runner, moves very well on the damp turf and gets up across the 35-yard line for what appears to be a first down for the Minnesota Vikings. For the Minnesota Vikings from the 36, Quazzo is back to throw. The Rams overrunning. He's away at the 40. Beasley throws a block to get him up near midfield. So an alert play by Gary Quazzo. He is finally run down and knocked to the turf by number 32, Jack Hardy. is loose. The pitch to Les Josephson is squirts around and Minnesota comes up with it. The 33-yard line for the Minnesota Vikings. John Beasley, the tight end, slips into the flat, makes the catch, gets up across the 40 to the 41-yard line. Eddie Metter, free safety number 21, made the tackle for the Rams. Bozzo on second down. Gives it to Bill Brown. 
And Brown strikes from the 41 to about the 49-yard line. Number 12 will punt for Minnesota, averaging 42 yards per punt. A two-man rush, the kick is away. A beautiful kick. Payman. Fumble. The Vikings may have it. Inside the Ram 20, they do. Brazo to throw. He throws wide open. Bill Brown, touchdown. Bill Brown got away in the secondary and went in all by himself, and the Vikings are on the board at 7.47 to go in the first quarter. We have a timeout at Met Stadium here in Minnesota with our score now. The Minnesota Vikings 7, the Los Angeles Rams nothing. Camera will take a look. You'll see Bill Brown, number 30, as he comes out of the backfield. Suazo goes back just in a pocket pass. You'll see Patios go over to cover him. I actually think that the man that's to cover him was my old buddy from Georgia Tech, the old Ramblin' Rick, number 55, Maxie Barnes, you see, come in. Gabriel gives it to Larry Smith. He'll sweep. Marshall is after him, and it's Marshall and Lonnie Warwick, number 59, that really high low end. Who is the quarterback. Bill Brown back with him, protecting on the pass as Quazzo delivers to John Henderson, number eight. Oh. And a penalty flag is down. Let's see if it goes against Henderson, the receiver, or Clancy Williams, the defensive back for the Rams. Osborne. He's busy. He's got a Minnesota first down at the Los Angeles 32-yard line. Deacon Jones brought him down. Ten yards on the play. Call it to 33. Quazzo gives it to Bill Brown, and Brown is heading for that 5,000 yards in a hurry. He's down to the Ram 25 for a pickup of eight. Brought down by Ed Metter. Ooh. Ball is at the Los Angeles, just inside the 24. And Let's go. Into the middle. Apparently for the first down, number 32, Oscar Reed. 5,000 marks. Ball is just outside the Ram 21. Quazzo back to throw in the pouring rain. Flips it out to Osborne. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, oh wow. the ball is loose. It is it's still loose. It's picked up by Clancy Williams of the Rams, and he comes back out to the 41-yard line. First half, Vikings lead 7-0. Third down, three yards to go for the Rams at their 20. Gabriel has it. He throws to Smith. Larry is caught. He had a first down, I think. The ball is loose. The officials have blown it dead. The Minnesota Vikings have the football. Alan Page, I believe, was the man that came up with it. Alan, Alan Page again, number 88. He's a great defensive player all the round. He puts on a good rush. He does have a habit of being where that ball is. He's come up with a couple. He came up with an interception for a touchdown this year. You'll see him there pick up the fumble. Those Vikings know when Page gets the ball, he's heading for the goal line. Knock the ball loose to get the ball to Allen. It's on the 14, first down. Quazzo goes for the corner. Henderson, he's got it out of bounds inside the five. That was a good gutsy call. You throw that thing out in the flat with a guy like Clancy Williams covering, and if it flips a little bit in this weather, you know that uh, there's a possibility of him picking it up, picking it off, and going all the way. But that. Second down, goal to go. Call it the four-yard line. Tanglehoff gives to Quazzo. Quazzo in trouble, and Troy Bacon hammers in. Yard line. It's third down and goal to go from the 16. That's Bill Brown going up the middle. He's now past the 5,000-yard mark. He's back inside the five to the four. Trey has 49 points. But right now, we zero in on Fred Cox. From the 13-yard line, it's good. And we have a timeout here in Minnesota. And our scoreboard now reads, the Minnesota Vikings 10, the Los Angeles Rams nothing. Larry Smith had two yards. Third down, eight from the 40 for the Rams. Vikings leading 10 nothing. Eller gets back. Maybe he didn't. Penalty flags are down. Gabriel looking for someone to throw to and cannot get rid of it. And again, it's Alan Page, number 88, knocking the Los Angeles quarterback down. Pick out the short one. Third down and seven from the 29. Gabriel back to throw. Nobody to throw to. He finally unloads it to Lester Josephson. It is short and incomplete. 
Wichita, Kansas, 67201. Tom McNeil, the punt on fourth down. Oh, it's almost blocked. Willie Ellison may have gotten a piece of it. It's a very short kick. Kermit Alexander on the sideline with a wall of blockers. He may go all the way. He is down. Jim Lindsay dragged him down at the two-yard line for Minnesota. Hey, in this the first half, if the Rams can get this over, well, it's a three-point differential, and as everyone would say, a brand-new ball game. Both tight ends, two action flying, are in the ball game now. Second down and goal from about two feet away. Gabriel quarterback sneak. He did not make it. The middle of that Minnesota line. The biggest. Did he fumble the ball? Uh, the time run out, time ran out. But it looks like he is calling them. Now let's see. Just hold everything. Quarterback sneak. Immediately call time and he heard the whistle. Gabriel tries again. He did not make it. He did not make it, and the Vikings pull. That's going to be tough to live with. Yes, sir. We've been talking about that one for a long time to come. Oh, my. We have come to the end of the first half with our score. The Minnesota Vikings 10, the Los Angeles Rams nothing. Howard Cosell will be back with a look. Cards on the play. Call it the 43-yard line. First down, Los Angeles, Minnesota country. Gabriel still got it. And down he goes under big number 77, Gary Larson, who used to be a Los Angeles Ram. The rain still pelting down, and Ray hits it well. Knocks it down to the one-yard line where Clint Jones picks it up. Look out, he's got a hole. And the last man, David Ray, was the one that really put the stopper on him. There, short seven. Flipping through the middle comes number 41, Dave Osborne, and I think he picked up a first down as he took it all the way to the Los Angeles 48-yard line. He did. Minnesota owns it, Los Angeles territory. Bill Brown again. Fumble! Rams have got it. North Minnesota recovers it. One of the Rams had his hands on it, but Gene Washington, wide receiver, came back and got the football, and Clancy Williams had it for a split second. Quazzo, Osborne. He's having a good night. Dave Osborne bounces and tumbles inside the 30 to the 28-yard line. Carries 53 yards, second down, long three. Bill Brown, brute strength, full power. Straight ahead, close to the first down. You know, they kid old Bill Brown here in Minnesota about being so bow-legged and... Uh, this him in the program is five foot eleven. He says, you know, if I get my legs straight now, I'd be six foot four like fullbacks are supposed to be. Two giants in professional football. A big play here for Minnesota. Bill Brown, straight ahead power. He's down to about the 18. It'll be short of the first down. They've got to go to the 16 to get it. It's going to bring up fourth down, and Fred Cox is coming on the field, the field goal unit. He has kicked six, 13 field goals and 16 extra points this year. It's from the 26-yard line. It is good. And we have a timeout here at Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, Minnesota, with the Minnesota Vikings now leading the Los Angeles Rams 13-3. to With the Rams 44, Roman Gabriel is the quarterback and gave back the throw. He looks and throws deep. It may be intercepted. It is picked off by Paul Kraut. The intended receiver, Jack Snow, made the tackle. The pass got away from Gabriel. He threw it well over the head of the intended receiver. And the Vikings have intercepted Gabriel for the fourth time tonight. Minnesota's ball, first and ten at their own 15. 5,000-yard mark. 13th man in NFL history to do it. It's third down. Eight yards to go for the Minnesota Vikings. Dave Arsman with the ball, slipping over the right side. He's up to the 24, close to the first down. Gabriel now 8 for 14, passing 52 yards. Back to throw here. Looking. He's going to run it. Hilgenberg. Hey, Alex.
Byron Page, number 88, that got in. Minnesota 44. Gabe. Hit by Marshall and uh, gets his pass away anyway, which is one of the redeeming qualities of him. Tommy Mason, the man closest to it. And Wally Hilgenberg really zinged him, but the pass is no good. The Los Angeles. Well, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say the 48-yard line. It'll be 52 yards. It's fake. Teddy Bone up with it. Former quarterback from Tulane trying to get around the corner. Cannot do it. He's run out of bounds, well short of the first down. Minnesota takes over, first and ten at their own 41, and Carl Eller was the man who knocked him out. On third down and nine, Gabriel to throw. Throws for snow, sideline incomplete. Off his hands, Bryant defending for Minnesota. 3-0-2 to play. Studstill wants to run, wants to throw. Pass is thrown downfield intended for number 19 Jim Nettles and it is incomplete and now with 254 to play in the ball game the Minnesota Vikings will take over the ball first down at the Los Angeles 27 as the clock runs out second down two yards to go for Los Angeles Gabriel to throw pressures on him loses the ball and Minnesota recovers it Carl Eller has the football Los Angeles play three-yard line and only 107 left to play. Well, this is about the only thing I can think of that hadn't happened to him yet. We look, Roman, he's going back trying to set up the pass. As he raises the ball up to throw, it just slips out of his hands. He couldn't get his feet under him in time to come back. Carl Eller was rushing and fell on it, so the Vikings have recovered it. The Vikings starting to leave the field, as you see. And the ball game is over. The final score, the Minnesota Vikings 13, Los Angeles Rams 3. We'll be back in a minute. Then it was on to Detroit and the title-minded Lions. Gary Quazzo threw for 253 yards as the Vikings' offense put together a consistent attack. The Lions fought with more than hope, though, and held a 14-10 second quarter lead. But the defense settled down and Bobby Bryant took an interception in for a touchdown. Then Gene Washington hauled down a 41-yard pass from Quazzo, and the Vikings had win number six, 30-17. The Detroit Lions share the lead in what many consider as football's toughest division, the NFC Central. Indeed, this year, Detroit fans have much to cheer about. The Lions sport a 5-1 record and once again have established themselves as one of the premier defensive teams in football. But today, they face their greatest test. Opponents are their companions in first place, the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings have sailed steadily through a brutal schedule. They have beaten the Kansas City Chiefs in their last two starts, have overrun Dallas and Los Angeles. Today's game should be a defensive classic. The Vikings are number one in overall defense. The Lions are best in rushing defense. While defense has long been a tradition in Detroit, this season the offense too has excelled. The Lions lead the NFC in scoring. One reason is that quarterback Bill Munson has been very good and his receivers have matched him. But the big difference in the Lions' roar has been their running. Farr has so far escaped injury, and Alti Taylor, his running mate, has been superb. For the first time in years, Detroit presents a balanced attack on offense. If there's one dark note, it is some key injuries on defense. Certain to miss today's game are two vital members, Joe Robb and all-pro Lem Barney. Barney's replacement, Bobby Williams, looms as one of the keys of today's game. The man who is most aware of this is Viking quarterback Gary Quazzo, who has finally emerged as number one after seven years of relief in Baltimore and then Minnesota. He leads an attack that ranks second only to Detroit's in the NFC. But the foundation of Viking football remains its great defensive platoon. They have allowed only 39 points so far this season. That's an average of just six and a half points per game. So it's Bud Grant's brutal Minnesota Vikings and Joe Schmidt's hungry Detroit Lions. First place is the prize. 
the Vikings' second series would be much less disastrous. Quazzo, like his professor at Baltimore, doesn't like to leave his pocket, but can and does when necessary. However, Quazzo preferred to establish his ground attack through others, and Dave Osborne, number 41, had some success. Another part of the Viking plan was to mix Osborne's runs with passes from Quazzo to his great receiver, Gene Washington, number 84. And this one was good for 35 yards. On a repeat of this third down play, watch Quazzo's protection. And then watch as Washington's 6'4 height makes it easy for him to grab Quazzo's slightly underthrown pass. First down on the Lions, 22. From here, the Lions dug in, and Minnesota failed to move on three straight plays. So Fred Cox came in and kicked a field goal, and the Lions now led seven to three. Following play, however, the Vikings did the job themselves. It was cornerback Bobby Bryant, number 20, who timed Munson's sideline attempt perfectly and went in untouched. With 10 minutes gone in the first quarter, the best pass defense in the NFL had put the Vikings on top, 10 to seven. The pattern of the game was now emerging. This would be a day in which defense would prevail. The Lions were unable to run at all on Marshall, Page, Larson, and number 81, Carl Eller, who was all over the field. Neither Mel Farr nor Alty Taylor could move on Eller and company and would make but one first down by rushing the entire half and only three for the game. But it was now the Vikings' turn and Quazzo began this drive by faking to Osborne up the middle and keeping himself around left end for 15 to the 44. This drive would be spearheaded, however, by Quazzo's passing. True, Quazzo was not in the top 10 statistically, but due to their defense, the Vikings rarely have had to resort to much passing, since they rarely have to sustain long drives. But Quazzo has an excellent arm, and the big play of this drive was a bomb to Henderson, who was whistled down on the six. On first and goal from the six, Quazzo again overthrew his receiver. The kid who caught the ball, however, did the best down and out, up, over, and in move seen here in years. Quazzo then chose his own receiver, and the result was six points. Bill Brown was the man with the ball, and the Vikings again had the lead. On a repeat, watch the Lions number 71, Alex Karras, get quickly by his man. But at age 35, Big Al just didn't have the speed to get Quazzo before he unloaded to Brown for the score. Vikings 17, Lions 14. With the Lions trailing by three midway through the second quarter, Munson could still afford to try and set up his passing with runs. But the Vikings' quickness is awesome, and safety Carl Kosulke came up to stop a third down play. Detroit had to punt again. Then for the first time in the game, the Vikings moved consistently on the ground. With Dave Osborne and number 30 Bill Brown carving out nines, tens, and fourteens, the Vikings drove to midfield behind the blocking of Yarry, Sunday, Davis, Vallone, and Tinglehoff. Quazzo's passes would now be more effective, and he sidelined one to Henderson, who almost became the headless Norseman on a necktie job by defender Bobby Williams. It was third and one at the Lions 42 and a big play. Dave Osborne went into the pile and came out with, you guessed it, first and 10 Vikings. Figuring history should repeat itself, even if it doesn't, Quazzo went for the bomb on first down. Washington and Williams ran neck and neck down the sidelines, and the taller of the two prevailed. Touchdown Vikings. It was 24-14, 
as the purple people eaters now were chewing away at the king of beasts. With 22 seconds left, the Lions tried an onside kick. It almost backfired. Oscar Reed scooped it up like an all-star shortstop, cut back through the middle and went to the 45. With 11 seconds left, Quazzo had time for one play and a field goal attempt. And he found tight end John Beasley, number 87, over the middle to the Lions 37. So Fred Cox came in to try to increase his conference scoring lead over Lion kicker Earl Mann. But his 45-yard attempt was wide left. The Tarzans of the North were in command of the King of Beasts as the half ended with the Vikings leading the Lions 24 to 17. 17, Detroit kicked off the second half to Clint Jones, who sped 30 yards up the left side of the field. The Lions are leaders in defensing the rush, allowing only an average of 85 running yards per game. Minnesota ran for 95 against them in the first half alone. But in the second half, Detroit shut off the Viking running game. So Gary Quazzo took to the air and threaded the needle to Beasley, despite blanket coverage by Mike Wigger. It was clear sailing for the big tight end until he was caught from behind by Bobby Williams. The pass covered 40 yards to the Detroit six. In three tries on the ground, Minnesota couldn't move against the Lion defense, so Fred Cox, the conference scoring leader, kicked a 10-yard field goal to give Minnesota a 10-point lead and a little breathing room. Detroit had a break and the ball near midfield. Munson immediately tried to capitalize by throwing long for Walton, but Ed Shirockman intercepted on the five and returned 42 yards to the 47. Then Quazzo on a rollout threw to Grimm in front of Bobby Williams for 18 yards. But this was the only interruption in the string of interceptions. For, as the fourth quarter began, Munson made the comedy complete by throwing still another interception, the fourth in five consecutive pass plays. Roy Winston was the recipient of this one. Fred Cox booted a 36-yard field goal, his third of the game, and 17th of this young season. Lions 17, Vikings 30. But Bill Munson and the Lions, trailing by 13 points, had to pass, and everyone knew it. 58,210 Detroit fans knew it. Bud Grant and the Vikings knew it. But most of all, the 11 men of Minnesota's magnificent defense squad knew it. And the results were disastrous for the Lions. On every attempt, Bill Munson was forced to hesitate because of the close coverage by Minnesota's secondary. And on every attempt, Munson barely ditched the ball before hitting the ground. The only pass Munson completed was thrown up like a balloon because of the Viking rush. And receiver Charlie Brown was called for offensive pass interference on the play, negating the completion. Greg Landry replaced Munson, but the result was the same. Landry was buried by the Minnesota muscle. Landry did complete one pass, however. This was a 23-yarder to Charlie Sanders, who had been virtually ignored by Munson. But except for the pass to Sanders, Landry could only complete harmless outlet passes to his setbacks. The Vikings secondary and linebackers were covering too well for these to mean much. Time and again, the Detroit setbacks were met hard for no gain. Most of the time, Landry ran for his life. He's a good running quarterback, but it's not the way to make up a 13-point deficit. The Viking defense had prevailed.
As a result of their victory today, the Vikings stand alone atop the Central Division of the National Conference. Their record is now six victories and one defeat. That lone setback was a three-point loss to Green Bay. Thus, the Vikings completed a remarkable run through some of the strongest teams in the NFL, and their schedule eases up a bit in the second half. The Lions are still alive, however. They only trail Minnesota by a game, and in two weeks, these two teams meet again. Thus, Detroit can sustain the division race by beating the Vikings in their own backyard. But the way Minnesota has been playing this task may be an impossible one. At the halfway point in the season, it appears no team in the NFL can match the method and muscle of the Minnesota Vikings. At Washington, the defense stormed in on Sonny Jurgensen, but it took four field goals from super kicker Fred Cox to win. Carl Kosulke's block punt sealed the skin's fate, 19 to 10. Two weeks on the road, the Minnesota Vikings return to the friendly confines of Metropolitan Stadium, perhaps the best team in pro football. Record-wise, the Vikings are the best. They came home today with the same record they had at this point last season. Seven wins and one loss. But head coach Bud Grant knows that this year's Viking team so far is not quite the same team that went to the Super Bowl. Their defense is the same juggernaut it has been, perhaps even better. But Minnesota's offense has been less than superb, and the defense has scored or set up more touchdowns than its offense. Detroit Lions head coach Joe Schmidt looks more concerned than Bud Grant, and well he should be. Like Grant's, Schmidt's defense is fine. But quarterback Bill Munson has made too many costly mistakes the past few weeks, and today Schmidt will instead go with his backup man, Greg Landry. Landry hopes to lead the Lions out of a depressing three-game losing streak, which included a loss to the Vikings two weeks ago in Detroit, and a loss to New Orleans last week, which will be remembered for years to come. The game in which Tom Dempsey's 63-yard field goal stunned Detroit 1917 as time ran out. This heart-rending loss put the Lions two games behind Minnesota and psychologically may have done them irreparable damage. So it was do or die for Detroit. Today's game was the showdown that in the end would probably determine the black and blue division champion and perhaps produce a world champion in January. This time, Quazzo mounted his first sustained drive. He was having no success on the ground, so the short outlet pass to Bill Brown now became his chief weapon, with which to negate the strong rush by the Lions' front line. Quazzo converted two key third down plays to keep it going. The short pass to Brown, and this one, a perfectly executed post pattern by Gene Washington, good for 30 yards to the Lions' 33, beating Lem Barney on the play. From here, Quazzo decided to probe the Lion flanks, and Dave Osborne, number 41, made his first good gain of the day. On first down from the 23, however, Quazzo again went to his prime receiver, Washington, and got another first down. Then Detroit dug in. Osborne was stopped cold, and his lateral back to Quazzo was after the whistle. On second and 10, a perfectly timed push by defender Dick LeBeau saved a touchdown and caused a headache. On third and ten, Quazzo just overthrew Osborne in the left flat. So Fred Cox was called in to try a 19-yarder. Cox converted for the 28th game in a row, and the score was tied at three. The three series in this quarter, but unlike the Vikings, each drive ended in disaster. On their first, Landry tried to go long, and Carl Kosulke intercepted. This led to Cox's missed field goal from the 51. Later, on the Lions' second drive, the Viking defense really came to life. 
Roy Winston, number 60, slowed up the interference and allowed Alan Page to stop Taylor. Then on third and 14, watch the Vikings standing up. That's number 29, Carl Kasulki, and he is about to perform the safety blitz with spine snapping efficiency. It's amazing Landry still knew what day it was, let alone what down, but he trudged off setting up a fourth down punt. Ed Shirockman then capped off this Vikings defensive portrait by blocking the punt right back into punter Herman Weaver's hands. Weaver had to go some 30 yards for the first down. He didn't make it. The Vikings now had it on the Lions 23, and on this series, went in to tie the score. Behind perfect protection, Quazzo hit tight end John Beasley, number 87, who broke a tackle, but stepped out at the six. Two plays later, Clint Jones followed Lyman Milt Sunday into the end zone. Thanks mainly to their defense, the Vikings had tied the game at 10, with four minutes left in the half. Detroit had excellent field position, but the Viking defense forced them to give up the ball. The Vikings had to get back on the boards fast, and led by the power running of Clint Jones, they started a move late in the third quarter. But it ended when Quazzo's quick turnout to Washington was ruled trapped by the official. Cox's field goal attempt from the 41 fell short, and Detroit had held again. A 20 to 10 score, Minnesota would have to begin their comeback now if there was to be one at all. Gary Quazzo started them off with a display of pinpoint passing. Gene Washington ran an out pattern for 10 yards, but Minnesota needed huge chunks of yardage. Quazzo got it on the next pass when Henderson eluded LeBeau and raced 40 yards down the left sideline to the five. He just missed going all the way. Clint Jones dove for the score. Minnesota had gone 60 yards and now trailed by only three. It was up to the Viking defense to stop Detroit one more time. But one man turned the tide. Number 29, Carl Kasulki stopped far when it looked like he might break free. Then on the next play, Kasulki broke a block and tripped Taylor for a loss. Detroit was forced to go for the field goal, but they muffed it. The Viking defense, led by Kasulki, had held. Now the offense had its chance. The Lion defense was playing deep to prevent the big play and Quazzo took advantage of the tactic to hit Henderson twice at opposite sidelines for small gains. But Minnesota needed the big play. With two minutes remaining, Quazzo was denied the deep pass again, and Jones, cutting across the middle, dropped the pass with a little help from Mike Lucci. Then came the key play of the game. It was third and 10. Quazzo had to make this pass work. He went for the bomb and Jim Lindsay made a perfect grab of the pass to put the Vikings on their opponent's five yard line. A repeat of this crucial play shows that safety Wayne Rasmussen almost got his hands on the ball then barely brought down Lindsay, who had his first reception of the season. Number 45, Bobby Williams, hopefully looked for a flag downfield, but it was wishful thinking. With one minute, 28 seconds left, Clint Jones swept left end for five yards and the go-ahead touchdown. The Viking machine had done it again. A 
A repeat shows the escort of blockers Jones had, but didn't need, as he beat Dick LeBeau to the corner of the end zone for his third touchdown of the day. Minnesota now led by four points, 24 to 20. Greg Landry had over a minute remaining in which to rally his team for a touchdown. A field goal was of no use. On the first play, Carl Eller broke through to throw him for a 14-yard loss. Second and 24. With one minute left, Landry on a keeper ran the left side for 16 yards. Third and eight, 56 seconds remaining. Landry passed to Walton, who juked his way to a few extra yards. First down on their own 35 and just 33 seconds left. Landry hit far, who just missed getting out of bounds to stop the clock. Three seconds remaining on the 41. Landry screens to Triplett, who eludes several tacklers before being brought down by Roy Winston, far short of the goal. The game is over. Minnesota had escaped apparent defeat by rallying for 14 points in the final 10 minutes of play to beat Detroit 24 to 20. The Vikings have now beaten the Lions six consecutive times. But more importantly, they have virtually wrapped up the National Conference's Central Division title. They now have a record of eight wins and just a single defeat and lead the Lions by three games with only five to go. The Vikings can now afford to think about a second straight championship. Next, another crucial game with the Lions. A loss would scramble the Vikings' title plans, and it looked as if the Lions would win. Bobby Williams ran a kickoff back 85 yards for a touchdown. Then the Lions forced a fumble by Gary Quazzo, and Mel Farr quickly gave them a 20 to 10 fourth quarter lead. But Larry Walton hit a wall, and Carl Kosoki demolished Greg Landry. And things began to happen. First, Ed Shirokman blew through and blocked a punt. Then a man named Jim Lindsay made his first catch of the season. It was the catch of a lifetime. With time running out, Clint Jones rounded left end, and the Vikings had a great victory. The Lions had nothing but disbelief. For Coach Joe Schmidt and his Lions, last Sunday's game against the Vikings was all important. For if they won, they'd be right back in the race. But if they lost, well, they gave it everything they had. The defense played superbly. They gave 100%. The special teams led by number 45, Bobby Williams, contributed an 85-yard touchdown run.
they gave 100%. The offense wanted to win so badly, they were willing to knock down fences. Sometimes they didn't get up and walk away. And sometimes, despite ferocious punishment, they did get up, but very, very slowly. The offense gave 100%. Eventually, the Lions' inspired defense caused a Gary Quazzo fumble. They took advantage of the break on a Greg Landry to Mel Farr connection. Detroit led and their fans loved it. Viking fans chanted to Thor and he must have heard because thunder boomed and the purple horde roared to life. Gary Quazzo to number 80, John Henderson set up a short Clint Jones touchdown. The Viking defense plied its specialty and blocked a punt. Gary Coazzo lofted a sky bolt to number 21, Jim Lindsay. But the Vikings still trailed and time was fast waning. Then for the third time in the game, Clint Jones, number 26, took the ball in and the Vikings had pulled it out. For them, it meant six wins in a row and an almost unbeatable lead in the NFC Central Division. For the Lions, it meant that hope was almost at an end and it proved that to beat the powerful Purple Pillagers, you've got to give more than 100%. And how do you do that? The Packer rematch followed in a sub-zero gale. The Vikings' defense proved to be the margin, holding Green Bay to three points. Gary Quazzo hit Gene Washington with a 37-yard shot, and then Clint Jones won the game with sheer second effort. The Vikings now had win number nine. The Packers traveled to face the Vikings in Minnesota, where 40 mile an hour winds brought the wind chill factor to 25 below zero. On the kind of day where every collision hurts, even the ball tried to avoid contact. It was the type of afternoon made for defenses, as both quarterbacks learned that handling the football was a dangerous proposition. The score at halftime was three all, and although the results were the same, the means were different. The Vikings relied on the rushes of Dave Osborne. While the Vikings ran, Bart Starr spurned the weather and threw the ball through the frozen air. In the second half, the team switched game plans.
Gary Quazzo teamed with Gene Washington to set up the only touchdown of the game on a run by Clint Jones. Meanwhile, the Packers turn to the run. Donnie Anderson sweet put the ball on Minnesota's 18-yard line with two minutes left. But when Larry Krause, number 30, fumbled and Jim Marshall recovered for Minnesota, the Vikings had their sixth straight win and a death grip on the NFC Central Division title. On to Shea Stadium and a chance to clinch the title. Joe Namath was sidelined and so was Gary Quazzo with a first quarter ankle injury. Bob Lee came in for Quazzo and directed his team efficiently. But the Jets were hot and the title would have to wait. New York won 20 to 10. Turner's field goal had put the Jets ahead by 10 with 12 minutes left in the half. But Turner hasn't been kicking particularly well this year, and a short kickoff here gave the Vikings good field position from which to start their third series of the game. This series would produce some results, but the man calling the plays was now Bob Lee. Quazzo had been injured on the last series. Lee sent Clint Jones into the line, and Jones, number 26, had the Vikings moving into Jets' territory. From the 33, Lee went to the air on first down, but just overthrew Gene Washington, who had early Thomas beaten by a step. The Vikings had to slow down the Jets' rush to make Lee's passing effective, so Lee went to the draw play, but Jones was stacked up. On third and long, the Jets again blitzed the linebacker. This strategy is dangerous, but forced Lee to unload to a safety valve, Jones, who was stopped well short of a first. A field goal followed, and it was 10-3 Jets series. In fact, they would go backwards, as Minnesota's number one defense stopped the run and the attempted pass with equal ability and would set their offense up inside Jets territory for their next possession forcing a punt from the end zone, which landed in New York's own territory. This was the key series of the half. The Vikings started from the Jets' 44 and looked like a cinch to add on some more points. But they again got nowhere. On third and 12, Bob Lee was again blitzed, and his hurried throw fell harmlessly incomplete. The Jets had found the Viking offense vulnerable to the blitz, and this strategy was the key to their success so far. Fred Cox tried from 51 yards, but he too failed. And New York now would try to run out the clock with five minutes left in the half. Jim Turner kicked a squibbler to Charlie West, and his 23-yard return gave Minnesota excellent field position at the Viking 48. When Lee passed to Washington at the left sideline for a gain of 33 yards, it looked like the Vikings had gotten their game together at last. But then the New York defense rose up. The final quarter began with the Jets again able to go nowhere against the Vikings. And for the third straight series, they had to punt after three plays. This time, the Vikings were able to take advantage. Bob Lee swung a pass to reserve setback Jim Lindsay, who bobbled, then went 16 yards before being bumped out of bounds. Lindsay has been a super reserve who often has come up with a timely play for his team. Today, he did it again as Lee came back with the same play, this time for the score. The pass covered 22 yards, and New York's lead was cut to 17-10. 
Then came the Bears for a rematch. While this snowmobile got off the ground, neither team could in the early going. But Bob Lee soon bounced back and floated a pass to John Henderson that brought a third straight Central Division title to Minnesota. In Minnesota, where the Vikings met the Bears, if the sight of a snowmobile on a snowless field seemed strange, it was only the forebearer of what was to come. The Bears took the stage first with Ron Smith, the first performer. Smith casualed over to a Viking punt and tried his version of steal the bacon. Don Shy provided the next act when he batted a pass back over his head right into Wally Hilgenberg's hand. Jack Cannon wrapped up the sideshow with his version of the drop back. Not to be outdone, Bob Lee, number 19, performed the drop back with handoff. The Vikings showed more diversification, for they had Dave Osborne, who could do the drop back too. Not surprisingly, the score at halftime was 6-6. The Vikings relied on the rushes of Dave Osborne. He gained 139 yards for the day, third highest in Viking history, and Clint Jones tacked on 61 more. The Bears, on the other hand, moved on the passes of Jack Concannon to league-leading receiver Dick Gordon. Lee, filling in for injured Gary Quazzo, managed one touchdown pass, a 33-yarder to John Henderson. Along with three field goals by Fred Cox, the Vikings led 16-6. But following his third three-pointer, he made the mistake of kicking the ball to Cecil Turner, who sprinted 88 yards to bring the Bears close at 16-13. It was Turner's fourth kickoff return touchdown of the season tying Travis Williams' 1967 record. But it wasn't enough as the Vikings clinched the NFC Central title and sent their fans home happy. Well, most of them anyway. With a title clinched, the Vikings traveled to Boston to visit their old comrade, Joe Cap. The Purple Gang greeted him a little too warmly. They held his runners to 56 yards and intercepted three of his passes. On this play, Ed Schirachman gave the ball to Wally Hilgenberg, who took off on the icy field for a meeting with Joe Capps. Wally saw Joe a little later. And Carl Kosoki ran into him too. Bob Lee, still subbing splendidly for Quazzo, came through with a red-hot 18 of 25 passes. This one to Henderson was the Vikings' first score. And this run by Lee was their last. The game ended with Minnesota on top 35-14 and with Joe Cap desperately trying to find someone willing to catch the ball. Even the referees had fun in Boston. Atlanta marked the end of the regular season. And although the Falcons pushed across the first touchdown with this punt return, the game was never in doubt.
Fred Cox punched through three field goals to end up the league's leading scorer for the second straight year. And Gary Quazzo came winging back, hitting John Beasley for a touchdown. Dave Osborne, who touched off the Vikings scoring in their first game, also notched the last touchdown as Minnesota won 37-7 to finish the season with 12 wins, two losses. Next, the playoffs and the San Francisco 49ers. For the second straight season, the Minnesota Vikings and the Atlanta Falcons finished the regular season in the soggy, soggy goo. But this year, Minnesota's super horde did not come unglued in Atlanta. Instead, the Atlanta Falcons offense suffered an acute attack of the virile Viking purple flu caused by an overdose of defense. The Falcons faltered both by land and by air, and number 20, Minnesota's Bob Bryant, added to ailing Atlanta's ills with this interception. Atlanta's only score came on this 74-yard slippery shot by John Mallory through the Vikings' usually stingy suicide squad. But the mighty, tough Minnesota destroyers were just too much football team for the Falcons. And Norm Van Brocklin still has a piece to go in Atlanta. Paul Krauss intercepted this Randy Johnson pass and advanced it inside the 10-yard line. And a well-recovered Gary Quazzo coupled with John Beasley for the score. Quazzo also teamed with number 27, Bob Grimm, and Grimm rested on his laurels after this nice catch. And Clint Jones plugged it in for six. Number 19, Bob Lee, turned to Dave Osborne for the Vikings' last touch. And at game's end, the Falcons were the worst for the treatment they took in the mud, 37-7. A win against the 49ers would put the Vikings on the road to their second straight league title. And that was what the football world expected. Abruptly, the tide changed. The Viking attack faltered. They were defeated 17-14. Jim Marshall later said, we won together, now we lost together. Together, they have forged 10 years of football history. Welcome to the fire and fury of Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, Minnesota, where the Vikings and the 49ers met to determine who would play the Dallas Cowboys for the NFC Championship. In Minnesota, this was known as a perfect day for football. Clear, crisp, and a pleasant eight degrees above zero. Just what the doctor didn't order for the Vikings enemy from the balmy Bay Area of San Francisco. 
Bud Grant's Minnesota Vikings reached the playoffs without much of an offense this season. True, quarterback Gary Quazza was hurt late in the year, but even when healthy, it was the highly touted Viking defense that had been their best offense, often scoring or setting up more points than the offense. Led by mustachioed Jim Marshall and all-pro Carl Eller, it was this defense that hoped to lead the Vikings to the Super Bowl again, a defense that had yielded an average of 11 points per game in regular season play. The San Francisco 49ers, led by coach Dick Nolan, have finally struck gold after 25 years of frustration. And unlike Minnesota, it has been their offense, and in particular, the NFC's MVP, John Brody, that has led the way. Brody has always done well statistically, but in 1970, he has had more opportunity to do his thing because of a reincarnated 49er defense that Coach Nolan has worked hard to perfect. Brody has with him both runners who can receive and receivers who can run, and this has helped him enjoy his finest of 14 years as a pro. So it was the NFC's best offense against the NFC's best defense in a classic confrontation of strength against strength. Would the 49ers leave their game as well as their hearts in San Francisco? Or would their prolific offense fry the Viking muscle men in frostbitten Minnesota? Fumbled on the 49ers' second play from scrimmage. Safety Paul Krause picked it up and took it in. The mighty Vikings defense had once again been their best offense and had given them a 7-0 pad to work on early. The key to so many Viking victories. But he went for Gene Washington deep and hit him. But the stylish second year receiver fumbled. And again, Minnesota's defense had come up with a big play to stifle San Francisco. He completed the pass over the middle to Bob Grimm and the Vikings had their first down on the San Francisco 42. A repeat of this important play from our isolated camera shows that despite a brush with a defensive back, Grimm had plenty of room to run his pattern. The 49er defense was hanging back to prevent a long gain, but once Grimm caught the ball, they came up fast and stopped him from getting out of bounds to halt the clock. Minnesota was forced to use a timeout, and with 27 seconds left, Quazzo passed again to Grimm, this time for 18 yards to the 49er 24. But once again, Grimm failed to get out of bounds, and his teammates desperately tried to get off another play without using their last timeout. They were unable to do so, and even more valuable time was wasted before the signal was given. Now, just seven seconds remained in the ball game. Minnesota got its score as Gene Washington made a fine play in the end zone, shielding Bruce Taylor away from the ball. His touchdown catch brought the Vikings to within three points of the 49ers, but there was only one second remaining. It began 10 years ago with a scrambling quarterback named Tarkenton running like a madman, trying to win. And fiery Norm Van Brocklin, coaching to win. The early Vikings were too eager though, too hungry. Jim Marshall made history by returning a fumble the wrong way. And Fran Tarkenton once scrambled for 18 seconds looking for a way to win. Always they were hitters. They could wear any uniform, any number, play in any stadium, any time, and you still knew they were the Vikings. They attacked people without thought for the odds. That's their unique character. But they didn't always win. 
Then the 1967 season and a new coach, Bud Grant. Joe Cap came along soon after, and the two instilled a winner's pride into a team that was weary of losing. Cap took them to titles in 68 and 69. Now the team had added a new dimension. They were winners. And they won mainly by building the best defense in football one that allowed less than nine points per game in 1970. A defense of 11 men with a unified purpose, to attack, to punish, to win. Over the past two seasons, the Vikings record is the best in professional football, but they won't look back. What counts is now, and they look to their second 10 years with one thought in mind, to win.